The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, About that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be grinding mill together, one will be taken and one will be left. Me. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding mill together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Happy New Year, St. Augustine. Now, if you like my wife or my daughter, when we first, when I first said those words to them, they looked at me like I had a problem. But I am talking about the church year not the Gregorian calendar, not the January to December calendar we're so used to. Yes, Advent begins the church year. It's that period in which God comes to us. It is Advent. That is why we have, you see blue, you see the Advent candle. We're now going to be in prayer B in our with our uh, lectionary, I mean, in our uh, commu- uh, Eucharist service. All the scripture readings during this period embody some theme of either hope, peace, or future, a future without fear. Our singing voices beseech, O come, O come, Emmanuel, during Advent, and it's replaced at the end, at the beginning of the Christmas season with a child named Emmanuel, God with us. Although Advent ends with the coming of Christ in the form of a baby, this is not the focus of today's readings. Today, we start, we don't start at the beginning, we start at the end. Walter Miller mentioned several weeks ago the eschaton, the end of time. This is when God's plan reaches fruition. The gospel tells the listener today to be ready for Christ's unexpected return with some going about daily, their daily task, 
some are taken and some uh, remain. And this is what has popularly been known as the rapture. Now, there is no scriptural foundation for that. You won't see the word rapture in the, in, the, in the Bible. And I will not be preaching on the rapture. I will leave that to the Last Behind series. However, this reminds me of a bumper sticker that I saw several years back. In case of the rapture, this, this car will be unmanned. I liked a lesser known bumper sticker, which was, in case of the rapture, can I have your car? <laughs> the prophetic voice of judgment, peace, and absence of fear is reflected in the second, of chapter, the second chapter of Isaiah today, in this one, uh, this one verse. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Isaiah's words are mirrored in the book of Ecclesiastes, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. It's a time to give up instruments of war, instruments of destruction, and it's a time to pick up instruments of um, growth or uh, production, peace. What can we say about our latest national election? Was this time to tear down or was this a time to build up. This election has been again a bitterly contested battle. You know, almost seven billion dollars were spent on political advertising alone. What was the opportunity cost for this expenditure? Opportunity cost is an economic term. It basically means what's the next best expenditure for this, these, this, this, these monies. The flaws on the other individual than they do in telling you what the heck this, this uh, politician believes in. What plans do they have to make it better? Those in power seek to stay in power. Those not in power seek to claim that power at any cost. Politicians running for office promise to reach across the aisle in a bipartisan fashion to work together. But alas, I find that they rarely do. Many citizens across the political spectrum wish that elected officials would work together to solve some of our financial and our social problems. Last, uh, at Halloween, there was a little political ad that came on and it shows, and I, I know y'all can't see this, so I'll explain it. Amanda and, and, and Lamar might be able to see it, but that's as far as it goes. But it shows, it shows uh, Linus, in his, in his pumpkin patch. And instead of, you know, of course, you, the, 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 the usual story is, is he waits for the great pumpkin to rise. Well, this one says, tonight is the night that the great bipartisan pumpkin will rise. 
And Sally is sitting, standing right next to him. Sally is Charlie Brown's sister. And he's saying, she's look, she thinks. But you know, I, like I said, I think we all hope for this bipartisan type of effort to find some common ground. So is Linus's hope a pipe dream? How did we become such a divided nation? And what can we do about it? Well, according to how, what has, how we become such divided, as such a divided nation, uh, my, there was a book recently that I finished called uh, High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out by Amanda Ripley. Now, she defines, she distinguishes between conflict and high conflict. Conflict is good. It can be motivating. It, you know, conflict can be good. It kind of lets what, what, other, what does the other side think about something. High conflict is when it becomes destructive. It divides couples, families, friends, groups, into a, into a dichotomy. You have the good and the evil. You have the angels or the demons. We know if, if your group, the us I like to call it, feel that your position is superior to the other. And we tenaciously fight for it without hearing the other's voice. We are confused why anyone with common sense would believe the way that they do. Whenever we encounter the other, either physically or on television or on social media, our chest begins to tighten we start having this gut reaction. We experience anxiety, fear, dread. The two groups, the them and us, become even more polarized, pulling into their separate corners, pointing fingers and yelling at each other, but not having any type of constructive conversation. Nothing gets done. Once the conflict reaches a certain point, we sometimes forget why we were fighting to begin with. In other words, the conflict takes over and that becomes the topic of this conversation. We become like those two 19th century Appalachian families the Hatfields and McCoys, we draw a dividing line separating one family from the other, looking for any evidence of some kind of infraction and responding with violence. Swords to plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Do we need to wait to the end times to find peace? Does the church offer any advice for this destructive conflict? And and I think so. The answers to these questions begin with a reminder of who we are, the us and the them, or what I like to call the we, both parties grouped together. Regardless of which group you hang with, both are created in the image of God and are loved in our diversity. We may differ in our political persuasion, but we all have one thing in common, the incarnation of the divine within us. When we are face to face with our neighbor, even our political rival, 
we are staring in the face of Christ. Therefore, we should respect the dignity of everyone. Treating them with dignity includes truly listening, keeping an open mind, restraining that, okay, I've got a gotcha to come back with before we've heard the other person out, and seeking common ground whenever you can find it. It's difficult to respect the dignity of others if you hang only with those that think like you, behave like you, over in your little respective corners. It's more difficult to demonize the other. It's more difficult to demonize the other once you interact with them, sharing your different views, in a, digni- in a polite manner and know that story. Now, when we pull back into our respective corners, isolating ourselves with the only people that think like us, we soon begin to fear each other. Does scripture offer any solace? You know, God frequently commands us through scripture, do not fear. In fact, some derivation of that do not fear occurs 500 times in the Bible. It's by far the one one theme that seems to be reflected in the Bible. For example, be strong and bold, have no fear or dread of them, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Deuteronomy. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. And one of my favorites, peace. I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them, the Gospel of John. Isaiah prophesies that the Lord will arbitrate with or judge all people at the end. But who does Isaiah say in today's reading will bring peace. Now let's revisit one, one verse. They shall beat swords into plowshares. They shall beat spears into pruning hooks. God will teach us, but we're the ones that, are, we, that have to make peace. Every conflict brings a, con- a opportunity to love them to carry out Jesus' commandment to love our enemies. Our words and future actions can either work for peace and reconciliation or they can continue the strife and conflict. The future is in our hands. We can't change the other. Well, that's a little bit more difficult for those that have ever tried to change their spouse, for example. I see, I see. We can only choose what we do and what we say. Swords to plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. So, in these contentious political times, remember who you are. Remember that God will never abandon us. Choose action that heals, not destroys. And as that opening collect directs, put on the armor of light, the armor of Christ, which lights the darkness between the us and the them, and maybe light the path to reconcile each other, each to the other. 
therefore will no longer be a be us or them for will be only amen amen